Hello viewers. Good day to all of you. This is Dr. BK for you. Who is actually going to discuss about some of the features of the skeletal system. So, we will be discussing about the general anatomical features of each system one by one. In this series, today I am going to discuss about the skeletal system. Now, in this lecture, we will be discussing mainly about the general features of bones and how do we actually classify bones. So, different types of classification of bones. The parts of a long bone, different types and loss of ossification, blood supply to a long bone, nerve supply to a long bone. Then the classification of skeletal system, then features of cartilages and different types of cartilages with examples. Okay. So basically we all know that skeletal system, what comes to our mind is bones. Even though this is actually true, but Bones constitute to only about 90% of our skeletal system and the remaining 10% is made by the cartilages. So whether it is a bone or a cartilage, both are actually connective tissue type and this is actually derived from mesoderm. So you all are aware of the mesoderm is one of the germ layer the other two being the ectoderm and endoderm. So, condensation of the mesoderm gives rise to the bones and cartilage. Okay. Now, the basic function of the skeletal system is mainly to provide supporting framework to the body. So, if there is no skeletal system at all, and naturally what happens is we will not have any shape. So all the muscles, vessels and other structures minus the skeletal system. So definitely we will be or we will appear like one ball of tissue. So the main thing what we should remember is it forms the supporting framework for the body. And second thing is anchoring the muscles. So, muscles mainly anchor to the bones. So, these two things are of prime importance. So, coming to the general characters of a bone, as I already told you, it is a connective tissue. It can also be called as or referred to as special type of connective tissue which is very hard. The hardness is mainly due to the impregnation of the inorganic salts into this tissue. So, mainly the calcium which is stored in the form of calcium phosphate and also calcium carbonate. Apart from calcium, bone also stores phosphorus in it. Okay? So, the hardness of the bone is mainly due to the impregnation of calcium salts. So, because it is hard and tough, so it does not mean it is a non-living tissue. It is a very much a living tissue and it has got a very rich blood supply. It has got a very rich nerve supply and not only that, it has got a very good regenerating capacity but only secondary to the blood and it shows a pattern of growth only then it will be able to maintain the shape. So, this is actually called as bone remodeling. Okay. Then of course, you all know that bones are mainly responsible for weight bearing and also bears certain impact especially like running, jumping, walking. So, naturally what happens is it molds according to the stress and strain. So, the hardness 
of the bones is mainly due to the impregnation of this inorganic salts mainly calcium whereas the cellular component is mainly by the collagen material which is present so mainly the fibers and all those things contribute to the organic component of the bone now various types of classification are used for bones so bones actually can be classified based on their external appearance how do they look they are based on their form so they have classified bones into many types then you have classification based on the structure so the external structure as well as you look at the internal structure based on the structure bones can be classified and based on the location where actually they are situated whether they are present in the main trunk of our body or whether they are present in the appendages or limbs so based on that one type of classification is there and bones are also classified based on their mode of development so we would like to see one by one regarding these various types of classification so based on external appearance what we have is long bone short bone flat bone irregular bone pneumatic bone sesamoid bone accessory and heterotrophic bone okay so i will repeat long bone short bone flat bone irregular bone pneumatic bone and sesamoid bones so these are very very important which you should know so we will see each type of these bones in brief okay long bones now long bones are mainly present in the limbs a classical example of a long bone is the ray femur which is the thigh bone or longest bone in our body then of course we have humerus the equivalent bone in the arm then radius ulna fibula tibia these are all the long bones which are present okay. a general structure of a long bone when you observe it what you have this long part is actually called as the shaft so a long bone has got a shaft and both the ends are expanded in a long bone and the one of the expanded end usually the upper end is actually called as the head okay and of course the other parts it differs from bone to bone you have what is called as greater tubercle lesser tubercle condyles and so on. so basically what you have is a shaft and upper ends are expanded and upper end is usually the head but in some bones the head is actually present in the lower Okay. okay then as i already mentioned long bones are mainly involved in weight bearing next what you have is miniature long bones so what are miniature long bones so bones mainly you see here these are all the bones which is present in the hand metacarpals they are called as metacarpals and of course this is actually called as the metatarsals okay so metatarsals and metacarpals are called as miniature long bones because they resemble something like a long bone but they have epiphyses only at one end so that is why they are called as miniature long bones the next type of bone what you see here is a modified long bone clavicle so it's a very unique bone this is called as clavicle or collar bone it is a modified long bone because it is the only long bone which is present horizontally in the body okay apart from that when you look at it clavicle has also got other peculiarities which we will be discussing in 
with the later crosses like it uh, does not possess a medullary cavity and so on. then other bones what you see here is the short bones which are the carpal bones which you see here bones of the wrist and of course bones which are present in the ankle region they are actually called as the tarsal bones they are all short bones then what we have is the flat bones so bones mainly forming the vault of your skull okay the neurocranium the vault of the skull they are actually called as the flat bones the scapula or the shoulder blade is actually an example of flat bone sternum ribs these are all flat bones so if you look at these bones especially the sternum ribs scapula and all the flat bones they are involved somewhat in lining the cavities and protective in function that is one thing and second thing is these flat bones possess a red bone marrow which i will be discussing after a few slides so we have seen about long bones miniature long bones we have seen about short bones we have seen about flat bones then you see here another type of bone which is actually called as irregular bones because the shape is not regular you cannot categorize them into flat or long or round or any way so that is why it is actually called as irregular bones examples of irregular bone is your vertebra your hip bone your vertebra and hip bone are classical examples of irregular bones then we have another type of bone which is actually called as pneumatic bones if you look at the pneumatic bones mainly you see the pneumatic bones they are filled with air spaces and they are mainly situated around your nose or nasal cavity so example is maxilla you know the bone which forms the upper jaw the maxilla then the ethmoid sphenoid and your frontal bone itself contains some air spaces they are called as paranasal air sinuses okay so these bones are actually called as pneumatic bones the next type of bones which we see here is actually called as the sesamoid bones when you look at the sesamoid bones they actually resemble that of a sesame seed so that is why it has been named as sesamoid bones the largest sesamoid bone in our body is the patella in a common man's term we call it as the knee cap now what is the distinguishing features of the sesamoid bone is they are developed inside a tendon so they develop within the tendon they lack periosteum they don't have medullary cavity and so on so what is patella one type of bone the other examples of sesamoid bones are pc form bone then one more bone which is not always present it is actually called as a fabella so all these are present inside the tendons like your patella is actually present within the tendon of quadriceps femoris your pc form bone is present in the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris and fabella is present in the tendon of gastrocnemius muscle which is actually present behind the knee so they alter the direction of pull of the muscle they reduce friction and they also to some extent aid in circulation so these are some of the functions of the sesamoid bones next type of bone is actually the accessory bones so accessory bones mainly sutural bones they are also called as vermian bones because they are present in the form of a worm like so that is why they are called as vermian bones so vermian bones a sutural bones is present between the sutures of the skull and there is no definite number or anything to actually confirm the presence of this vermian bones or accessory bones okay. 
so far we have seen the classification of bones based on the external structure or form now we will come to the next type of classification what you see here is classification based on structure the based on structure you have only two type of bones one is actually called as the compact bone and other one is actually called as the cancellous bone so a compact bone what you see here is a thick bar of bone which is ivory like very hard even though it is porous to some extent but it is a thick table of bone seen in the shaft and mainly forming the outer two third as you proceed towards the medullary cavity this compact bone will be replaced by the cancellous bone okay so will be replaced by the cancellous and internally the medullary cavity will be lined by a membrane which is actually called as the endosteum and of course long bones are filled with yellow bone mantle okay so compact bone is ivory hard like thick bar of bone forms the cortex of the bone as you proceed towards the medulla or near to the ends you find another type of bone which is actually called as the cancellous bone so cancellous bone or spongy bone why it is cancellous or spongy because it consists of numerous spaces in between them and these are all what you see here is the bony lamella so mainly seen near to the medulla and in the ends of the long bones they are trabeculated or mesh like so that is why it is called as cancellous or spongy bone and mainly they contain the red bone marrow they contain the red bone marrow okay now the cortical bone what we saw as the compact bone is a perfect adaptation of the compressive forces especially which is taking place in weight bearing but whereas the cancellous bone is mainly adapted or perfect adaptation of the tensile forces so mainly with response to the tension it is adapted and you see the cancellous bone is actually arranged in the form of a lamella and their lamella are actually called as pressure lamella and tension lamella so both the lamella will be present at right angles to each other so based on the structure we saw two types of bones one is actually called as the compact bone and other one is actually called as the cancellous or spongy bone further coming to the structure of a long bone when you look at the structure of a long bone i told you it has got a long shaft the shaft externally it is covered by a membrane which is actually called as the periosteum so the periosteum is a membrane which actually can be stripped off from the bone it is actually attached to the outer surface of the bone with the help of a fibers which is actually called as the sharpies fibers and more deeper layers of the periosteum you go it is actually osteogenic in nature so that means it is responsible for the production of the bone cells so osteoblast from this osteocytes uh, they come so they actually form a reserve from which whenever needed they supply the osteoblast for the bone growth and re modeling okay now this periosteum is actually present especially the shaft but it is absent in the ends where it is going to articulate and form a joint and apart from that the periosteum is also absent in sesamoid bones okay so the cavity of the shaft is mainly red bone marrow only during the birth so during birth or in the fetal stage what happens is it produces red bone marrow but later as the growth advances or age advances the cavity of the long bones is actually replaced by the yellow bone marrow 
and red bone marrow persists only in the ends of the long bones and especially in the flat bones, your ribs, sternum, vertebra and skull bones. So we have seen about the shaft. So the shaft mainly consists of the compact bone and as you go deeper what you consist of cancellous bone and you have the bone marrow filled with the yellow bone marrow, marrow cavity and lined internally by the endosteum and externally it is lined by the periosteum. Now coming to the ends of the bone, you see here, the ends you call it as epiphysis. So epiphysis is the term given to the ends of the bone. There are two types of epiphysis. One is actually called as the simple epiphysis and other one is actually called as the compound epiphysis. So what do you mean by a simple compound epiphysis? Simple epiphysis is numerous epiphysis develops, they all fuse together, forms a single structure and then they unite with the shaft which is actually called as the diaphysis. This is called as simple epiphysis. In case of compound epiphysis, what happens is, numerous epiphysis, they actually what happens is, they fuse with the diaphysis separately. So, one epiphysis will form. It fuses separately with the diaphysis irrespective of the other epiphysis. So, this is actually called as the compound epiphysis. So, the epiphysis of the bones are also classified into four types which we will be discussing after a few slides. Now, the next type of classification is classification based on development. So, we have seen classification based on structure, we have seen classification based on external appearance or form, now we are going to see classification based on development. So, bones develop by a process which is actually called as ossification. So, ossification is the term given to the process of formation of bones. Okay. Now, bones are formed by two methods. One is actually called as the membranous ossification and other one is actually called as the cartilaginous ossification. The cartilaginous ossification, cartilage, the other name for cartilaginous is actually chondra. So, that is why it is actually called as endochondral ossification. What happens in the case of endochondral ossification is mesodyne condenses then it is actually replaced by mesenchymal tissue. This mesenchymal tissue before converting into bone, a cartilage model is developed and that is actually called as endochondral ossification. Okay? And the place where the bone formation starts, where the bone cells osteocytes starts depositing, that place is actually called as the ossification center. Okay? So, endochondral ossification means what happens is from the embryonic connective tissue, a cartilaginous model is first formed and then what happens is the bone cells are deposited. So, this is called as endochondral ossification. The next type of ossification, we will come to it later. Before that, what happens is, ossification centers are mainly one for the shaft or diaphysis and that is the primary ossification center which appears for the shaft and usually appears before birth. Secondary ossification centers are more than one, it might be two or three for each end. And what happens is the secondary ossification center fuses with the primary ossification center. And before that, you will have a plate of cartilage here. This is actually called as the epiphyseal plate or growth plate cartilage. So, once what happens is the ends of the epiphysis this fuses by the ossification of this growth plate cartilage, then the growth of the bone in length stops after that. Okay? So, parts of a young bone, what we have is diaphysis, which is called as the shaft. 
the ends are actually called as the epiphysis the end of the shaft is actually called as metaphysis between the metaphysis and the epiphysis you have a plate of cartilage which is the active zone of growth that is actually called as the epiphyseal plate of cartilage so these are the parts of a growing long bone so as i already told you primary center for the shaft appears before birth during the 8th to 10th week of intrauterine life and mainly responsible for the formation of the shaft secondary centers appear after birth and some even appear even after puberty and the secondary centers what happens fuses with the primary centers around the age of 25 years after which growth in the long bone ceases and this is one or two years most probably one year it appears uh, before in case of the females in females what happens is it is average it is one year earlier the fusion takes place so growth of the long bone ceases one year earlier as compared to case of the in case of the males now coming to the epiphysis definitely you should know about the types of epiphysis there are four types of epiphysis the first type is actually called as the pressure epiphysis which you see along the head of the femur especially they are mainly responsible for withstanding pressure they are molded to withstand pressure weight bearing they are involved in weight bearing traction epiphysis the next time you are able to see here traction or pull so they are mainly developed mainly into the pull of the muscles or tendons attached to it example is tubercle of humerus condyles of femur and so on the next type of epiphysis is atavastic epiphysis a very good example is the coracoid process of scapula so if you look at phylogenetically in the lower forms this might have been an individual bone and finally what happens it has fused and that is why we call it as atavastic epiphysis the other epiphysis is aberrant epiphysis mainly which is in the head of the first metatarsal or base of other metacarpals okay so this is called as aberrant epiphysis it will look like a small nodular bone in the radiographs which you come across so four types we have seen pressure traction atavastic and finally what we have seen is the aberrant epiphysis okay. so we have seen about endochondral ossification especially which takes place in the long bones and you have seen the parts of the long bones like diaphysis epiphysis metaphysis epiphyseal plate of cartilage there is one more ossification type of ossification which is actually called as the membranous ossification what happens in the case of membranous ossification is i told you the embryonic connective tissue is actually called as the mesenchyme this directly bone deposition takes place into this mesenchymal cells and therefore the bone is formed so a cartilage model is not formed so this actually the step of forming cartilage model is skipped here and naturally membranous ossification takes place in which all bones membranous ossification takes place mainly the bones of the vault of the skull frontal parietal occipital bones mainly membranous ossification takes place some bones which forms the base of the skull are partly membranous and partly cartilaginous so they are called as membrano cartilaginous bones okay so occipital bone which you see here they partly contribute to the vault and also to the base of the skull and one more bone the sphenoid bone is actually present in the base of the skull are actually very good examples of membrano cartilaginous ossification okay so you see about two types and not only two combination of two is the third type which is actually the membrano cartilaginous ossification we have seen what is primary ossification center we have seen about what is secondary ossification center now we will go to the law of ossification so law of ossification states that 
The first form secondary ossification center that is at the ends epiphysis is the last to fuse. Okay. So, the first formed secondary ossification center will wait for the other ossification centers to appear and fuse and only finally this fuses with the diaphysis or the shaft of the bone. Only then and mainly the main reason for this is to facilitate growth. The only bone which does not obey the law of ossification is fibula and to be more correct is the lower end of fibula where the first formed secondary ossification center is the first to fuse with the diaphysis. So, we have seen the classification of bones based on the external form, based on the structure, based on the type of ossification or development. Now, we are coming to the blood supply of the bone. So, bone has got a very rich blood supply. The shaft is mainly supplied by the nutrient artery. The nutrient artery enters into the shaft through a foramen which is actually called as the nutrient foramen. Once it enters, it immediately divides into ascending and descending branches and these branches again they divide near the ends that is the metaphysis. In case of a growing bone in the young one or infants, so these arteries what happens is since it is not fused, the epiphyseal plate of cartilage is present. These arteries what happens is they are end arteries and make hairpin like bend. So, what happens is if any embolus or infected material gets lodged into these arteries, they get stuck in this hairpin beds and naturally they interfere with the blood supply and ultimately what happens is they interfere with the ossification or formation of the bone. So, nutrient artery mainly enters the nutrient foramen. The nutrient foramen is actually directed away from the growing end. So, I, it is actually away from the knee and towards the elbow. I go towards the elbow and I flee from the knee. So, this is the dictum for the nutrient foramen. Okay. So, this nutrient artery once they enter they divide into branches and they once the ossification is over in adult bone what happens these arteries fuse with the other arteries like the epiphyseal arteries and the metaphyseal arteries. Okay. Now, this nutrient artery mainly supply the inner part of your cortex medulla medullary cavities. The outer part of the cortex and the periosteum is mainly supplied by the periosteal arteries. So, the periosteal arteries ramifies beneath the periosteum and it is actually derived from the neighboring systemic vessels which is responsible for the supply of the periosteum and the outer one third of the cortex. Okay. So, these are the periosteal arteries which you are actually seeing. The other arteries what you are able to see is the epiphyseal arteries. The ends of the bones when you look it has got numerous foramina extremely porous and these not all the pores allow the arteries, only few are actually allowing the arteries while the other are for the weights to exit. So, epiphyseal arteries enters this numerous foramina and supply the ends of the bones and you also have metaphyseal arteries which is again derived from the neighboring systemic vessels. For example, if it is a humerus, the neighboring vessel will be the brachial artery. The brachial artery is definitely going to supply the nutrient artery and it will also give the epiphyseal branches. So, this metaphyseal arteries will reinforces the branches from the nutrient artery. Okay. So, you have seen blood supply of the bone is mainly through the nutrient artery, periosteal arteries, metaphyseal arteries and the epiphyseal arteries. Coming to the nerve supply of the bone, so bone is very much sensitive to pain. So, the nerves accompany the artery and mainly they are sympathetic, so they carry pain sensations as such and they are also vasomotor in function to the blood vessels they are vasomotor 
and mainly the sensory ones are mainly to the periosteum. Periosteum is mainly much sensitive to pain and also to the articular ends we have the pain fibers supply. So nerve supply of the bone is mainly sympathetic and mainly they are vasomotor in function and few are sensory mainly to the periosteum and the articular ends. Okay. So just some of the terms I have introduced for you which you commonly come across in the bones especially more commonly you will be coming across this epicondyle or a prominence above the condyle, condyle then you come across the tubercle, tuberosity, trochlea means this pulley shape then you have fovea which you simply call it as a pit or a fossa which is not depth or deep like fovea but it is somewhat a shallow bit. Antrum is a cavity and spinospinous process you all know a sharp pointed process. Sulcus is a groove or furrow. So some of the common terms you come across in the birds in the bones. So diseases of the bones mainly what is osteomyelitis. So infection, bone infection which is a bit serious. It is not like some infections which you come across lung infection or your throat infection something like that. Infections of the bone mainly travel through the blood vessels and what happens is most commonly staphylococcus the most common organism seen in the osteomyelitis. So which leads to infection of the bone. The next uh, common type which you see in the aged persons is osteoporosis. So in the osteoporosis what happens is there is a reduction in the bone mass. So that is why in the normal bone here you see this bony lamella is almost lost. Okay. So the density of the bone decreases. So that is actually called as osteoporosis. Mostly seen in women above the age of 40s or 50s. Then you also come across bone tumors. One is benign tumor which is restricted only to that part. The other one is actually called as osteosarcoma. It is a type of bone cancer. So you see swelling or growth on the bone on that particular place. Osteomalacia. So what is actually osteomalacia? So osteomalacia as I told you mostly seen again in children. In what way osteoporosis is different from osteomalacia is? In the osteoporosis what happens is there is a depletion of the calcium content reduction in bone mass. Here there is no reduction in bone mass but mineralization does not take place. That is the main difference between the osteoporosis and osteomalacia. And of course final one you would all have heard about what is this rickets mainly due to the vitamin D deficiency, you get rickety bones or you call it as rickety rosary. Then, so while these are some of the diseases of the bone, injury to the bone mainly be due to mechanical forces, impact from external object or fall and break in a bone is actually called as a fracture. So a fracture can be of two types, one is actually called as a simple fracture and other one is actually called as a compound fracture. Simple fracture is when the bone breaks but does not pierce the skin and come out and causes a open wound. This is called a simple fracture. Compound fracture is when the broken bone penetrates to the skin and naturally what happens when the wound communicates to the exterior that is actually called as the compound fracture. So whatever might be the type of fracture it is reduced mainly by aligning it properly, realignment of the bone and immobilization. So until the bone is realigned and grown properly, immobilization is definitely necessary. And here you come across certain types of fractures. Most commonly seen fracture is communicated fracture when the bone breaks into many pieces. When you have a crush injury of the bone when very a heavy object falls we have a crush injury, it is called as compression fracture. When the bone is actually after breaking is actually pressed inwards, it is a depressed one. 
when the two broken ends are forced on top of each other then naturally it is actually called as an impacted fracture so what happens is the bone will actually slip and go and lie on top of the other bone that is actually called as impacted fracture spiral fracture when the break is actually in a zigzag or in a spiral fashion green stick fracture you mostly come across in very young children and infants the bone breaks but there is what happens is a small connection uh, between the two broken parts and that is why it is actually called as green stick you have seen a green twig you try to break the twig it won't break into two pieces you see a small connection like that between uh, these two parts okay so finally let us also try to summarize certain functions of the bone as i already told you store of calcium and calcium is stored in the form of calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate it is involved in erythropoiesis especially the red bone marrow in adults and all the bones are involved especially fetus then it is also responsible for the production of reticulo endothelial cells which are mainly involved in immune responses and the last two we have already discussed it provides attachment for muscles tendons and ligaments it is protective in function mainly to the brain that is all the skull bones your heart lung which is actually present in the thoracic cavity so it forms cavities especially the flat bones form cavities cranial cavity thoracic cavity pelvic cavity your spinal cord is present inside the vertebral column and it also gives some protection to the abdominal organs uh because your liver is very much present uh, within the costal margin your spleen okay the skeletal system of the human body is mainly classified into two types one is actually called as the axial skeleton the axial skeleton is actually present in the midline and mainly contributes for the tongue of the body the skull the ribs your sternum the vertebral column are all parts of the skeletal system the axial skeleton it forms the axial skeleton whereas the appendicular skeleton mainly is formed by the bones of the upper limb and mainly the pectoral and pelvic girdle so what is a pectoral girdle what is a pelvic girdle a girdle is something which attaches your appendicular skeleton to the axial skeleton so that is actually called as the girdle so upper limb is attached to the axial skeleton to the pectoral girdle and lower limb is attached to the axial skeleton by the means of the pelvic girdle so i just you can see the listing of uh, the number of bones so we all know that in our body we have totally 206 bones so axial skeleton contributes to around 74 bones 26 in the vertebral column if you count you should actually consider five piece of sacrum as only one piece same way coccyx as only one piece then you get seven cervical 12 thoracic five lumbar five sacrum and one coccyx leading to 26 bones then skull consists of 22 bones eight bones form the vault of the skull and the remaining 14 bones forming your facial skeleton or visceralcranium it is actually called as visceralcranium and vault of skull is actually called as neurocranium then 12 pairs of ribs 24 ribs and one sternum totally accounting to 25 so it comes to 74 bones in the axial skeleton appendicular skeleton upper extremity has got 64 bones whereas lower extremity has got 62 why the difference in two is because here the carpal bones are eight in number but whereas the tarsal bones are only seven in number so naturally two bones for each side there is a difference then of course you have the auditory ossicles the three ossicles for each side so totally six ossicles they are malleus incus and stenes so the auditory articles ossicles are the bones which are fully developed during birth itself So total bones, including the axial skeleton and upper dorsal skeleton, accounts to two not six bones. 
Okay. So we have seen mainly regarding the bones in the skeletal system. We have seen about the classification of bones, how they are classified based on the structure, development, the form and all those things. Then we have seen parts of a long bone, parts of a developing bone, types of ossification. Then we have seen about loss of ossification. Then of course we have discussed about the blood supply and nerve supply of bone, some common bone diseases. Then classification of our whole skeletal system of the body into appendicular skeleton and axial skeleton. Now a second part of this lecture, we would like to see certain aspects of the cartilage because cartilage is also a part of the skeletal system. So connective tissue, it is also mainly composed of cells and fibers. The cells of the cartilage are actually called as the chondrocytes. The fibers they might be collagen or elastic fibers. The cells and the fibers are actually embedded in a ground substance or what you call it as a matrix. What is the main difference between a cartilage and a bone? The bone is very tough and hard whereas cartilage is resilient. So little amount of elasticity or flexibility is present. So naturally for certain tensile strength it actually molds for some bending forces. So that is the main difference between the cartilage and the bone and it also accounts for part of the skeletal system. But cartilage lacks blood vessels. So naturally the nutrition is only through diffusion from the surrounding tissues. They lack nerves, so no nerve supply to the cartilage, so naturally they are insensitive to pain. Then, like periosteum, cartilage is also externally surrounded by a membrane, it is actually called as perichondrium, and this perichondrium is absent in articular cartilage. So, that is the ends of the bones where it takes part in joint, is called as the articular surface of the bones. These bones, part of those bones will actually be covered by a cartilage and it is actually called as articular cartilage. And naturally what happens is perichondrium is absent in articular cartilage. So basically three types of cartilage are present. First we are going to see is the hyaline cartilage. Hyaline, the name is hyaline means glossy, transparent or transparent and white. These behaves like cartilage which is called ice on ice, namely they form the articular cartilage. So all the articulating surfaces of bones are mainly covered by the articular cartilage. Okay. Is it 100%? No. Certain areas it is actually covered by fibrocartilage. So mainly bones uh, of the mandible mandible, temporomandibular joint. So one example where the articular surfaces are actually called the fibrocartilage. So apart from that, if you look at the structure of the hyaline cartilage, what you see here is the chondrocytes which are present and they are present in groups and that is actually called as the cell nests and there is a space surrounding this cell nest which is called as lacunae and this matrix or ground substance is actually called as homogeneous matrix because they are uniform throughout and embedded in this ground substance which is invisible to the naked eye is the fibers. In hyaline cartilage what you see is the collagen fibers. Why we are not able to visualize the collagen fibers in the ground substance is because the refractive index of the ground substances and the collagen fiber is the same. So that is why what happens it appears as if the collagen fiber is absent in the ground substance. So mainly fibers of composed of collagen fibers, ground substance and chondriotic surface and presence of perichondrium. So the hyaline cartilage has got a perichondrium, only the articulating surface this perichondrium will be absent. So why actually perichondrium is absent? Because in the articulating cartilage what happens is when there is an rubbing of the cartilage between these two 
naturally there is a tendency of the pericondrium to get rupture. So this is the articulating surface of bones. So here you are seeing the classical knee joint example. This white color thing what you are seeing it is covered by hyaline cartilage. So why hyaline cartilage? Because it is transculent and glossy. So that means very smooth articulation between the bones. So example of articular cartilage is examples of hyaline cartilage is articular cartilage and other one is developing long bones. So hope you remember that few slides back we have seen about the ossification of bones or development of bones. In that we have seen two types one is endochondral ossification cartilage model is first formed before the incorporation of the osteocytes. So that cartilage model is mainly this type of cartilage which is the hyaline cartilage. The next type of cartilage is elastic cartilage, it is also called as yellow elastic cartilage. Here also what happens you see chondrocytes and the fibers present in this is not actually collagen fibers, they are elastic fibers. The elastic fibers what happens is they are branched fibers. The elastic cartilage is not transculent like the hyaline cartilage, it is about opaque and also yellowish in nature. It has got a perichondrium outer covering, this is actually called the perichondrium and elastic cartilage is mainly seen in the pinna of your ear, external ear, pinna, your epiglottis, your epiglottis auditory tube, all these things are actually made up of elastic cartilage and some parts of the laryngeal cartilages also. The parts of arytenoid cartilage and all those things are made up of elastic cartilage. The next form of cartilage is the fibrocartilage, very tough cartilage, cartilage of wear and tear, white and opaque, thick white because of the dense amount of the collagen fibers present here and they do not have perichondrium where actually they are present in a good examples is intervertebral disc between the two vertebra you see a disc intervertebral disc so they are all under the constant compressive forces so that is why you need a very thick cartilage intervertebral disc an intraarticular disc sometimes inside the joint cavity you see a disc which divides the joint cavity into two, intraarticular disc, you come across uh, inside the knee joint, you have some intraarticular structures, sternoclavicular joint, you also have an intraarticular disc, mainly the intraarticular disc is to permit two types of movements, so above the disc one compartment, one movement it will permit, below one compartment, the intra, intra, the lower compartment permits another type of so this is about the fibrocartilage and elastic cartilage. Now fibrocartilage or elastic cartilage does not undergo calcification. So what is mean by calcification is if the calcium gets deposited in there, then the, it becomes hard like a bone that is called as calcification. So calcification is actually possible in hyaline cartilage. So sometimes age advances, what happens is the hyaline cartilage, it becomes calcified, especially the costochondral junctions of the ribs. The ribs articulate the sternum anteriorly with the help of cartilage. So they might get calcified. Okay. So that is one dis uh, thing which you come across in the hyaline cartilage. But elastic cartilage does not undergo calcification or fibrous cartilage does not undergo cartilage. So with respect to cartilage, we have seen about three types of cartilage. One is actually the hyaline cartilage, other one is the elastic cartilage, and other one is the fibro cartilage. So elastic cartilage and hyaline cartilage are perichondrium, whereas fibro cartilage does not have perichondrium. The cells of cartilage are actually called as the chondrocytes. They are embedded in a ground substance called as matrix. This ground substance or matrix contains fibers within it. Collagen fibers in case of the hyaline cartilage and the fibrocartilage, whereas in the elastic cartilage it is mainly composed of the elastic fibers. 
so that is the pinna an example of elastic cartilage and here you come across the intervertebral discs which is an example of fibro cartilage so thank you very much for listening to this lecture so we will meet again in some other topic